All right, welcome everyone for the uh, second uh, seminar for the uh, this semester birds uh, series. Uh, before we, uh, before I hand it over to Ling Ying, I just want to remind everyone that uh, this talk will be recorded. And if you are a registered participant, then you will receive the talk as well as the Ling Ying slides uh, after the seminar. Uh, if you have, so you're automatically muted, but if you have any questions, just please type in the question in the chat window and I will monitor the questions uh, for Ling Ying. So today we have uh, Ling Ying Ji uh, from Penn State HHD, and uh, she's a postdoctoral uh, scholar at the Quantitative Development Systems and Methodology Core. Uh, Ling Ying's research interests include developing and applied dynamic systems modeling and machine learning techniques to uh, investigate sleep health in different contexts. Uh, so she's going to talk some of those research at, at today's talk. Without further ado, Ling Ying, take it away. Um, thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, I'm actually currently doing a postdoc in biobehavioral health, but I'm still uh, collaborating closely with the um, quantitative development lab. And uh, my research interest lies broadly in modeling dynamical systems, longitudinal data, and applying those methods to uh, empirical uh, research, especially in sleep studies. And in this presentation, I'm going to show some of our recent developments in integrating some of the dynamic systems modeling ideas to machine learning algorithms and uh, exploring how to optimize those algorithms in applying them in sleep research. And uh, this is uh, some um, preliminary work and we are still exploring. So if you have any suggestions or um, comments on how to improve, um, you, uh, it will be really appreciated. And uh, this work is also in collaboration with uh, folks from industrial engineering and operation research. Um, so um, Dr. Manlio and Dr. Sandra Kumara also contributed a lot to this work. And uh, the, um, sorry, um, I saw there are still people coming in the meeting room. Um, Am I supposed That's to... okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. I mean, I'll you, monitor. You are okay, that sounds great. Uh, so uh, the topic for uh, today's presentation is sleep weight classification of active graph data, a machine learning approach. And I will first start with some background, background knowledge about sleep, sleep data, and sleep scoring. And then I'll go on to talk about um, a machine learning model that uh, we have explored for sleep weight classification. And um, after that, I will uh, describe some ongoing work uh, that we are um, uh, working on, and uh, we will end with a discussion. Um, probably I won't need to um, spend too much time explaining how important sleep is. Um, we already know uh, and that uh, sleep is crucial for a lot of aspects of our life, including uh, memory, uh, stress, depression, psychological health, and um, cardiac risk. And, and also, um, it is uh, found to be associated with um, mild cognitive impairment and uh, Alzheimer's disease. It is recently um, identified as life simple aid for heart health. And um, however, um, we are still um, looking for better ways to measure sleep. Uh, and in other words, improve measurement of sleep so that we can better understand and man manage our sleep. To just emphasize how um, prevalence of sleep issue is in the United States, we can see from this um, graph from um, CDC um, behavioral risk factor civilian system that in the United States around a 30 to 40 percent of adults reported that they have shorter sleep than um, less, less than seven hours. And even though um, during um, the COVID pandemic, a lot of people get a chance to choose to stay at work from home and um, maybe perhaps able to save some commute time, um, people are still, still reporting pretty high range of um, issues with problems like insomnia. So for instance, uh, in 2020, for, um, just the first few uh, months of the pandemic, over um, 
there we, we've seen more than uh, fifty eight percent of rights uh, in reports of search in of insomnia and other uh, sleep disorders. Uh, we all know that the most accurate way to measure sleep is using pulsography, which is a kind of way to measure brain waves and then um, infer whether the person is uh, asleep or awake from those brain waves. Uh, when I first showed this graph, uh, my postdoc advisor laughed at me because uh, this is pretty um, um, old, and he said it's from the mid -age, Middle Ages. So I find a better representation of how um, a PSG uh, system looks like um, in modern world. But you can see that even with more advanced technology, um, people still need to be wired up to get their brain waves. And uh, you can perhaps imagine this is not that um, easy to do and not feasible for everyone. And perhaps the, the participant will also uh, feel uncomfortable if um, they have to be uh, stay in those sleep sections for a prolonged period of time. So uh, most, a lot of sleep researchers start to use wearable device like ActiGraph to uh, make uh, sleep memory more accessible to more participants and enable longer time of monitoring of sleep. So with ActiGraph uh, or similar um, methods, participants wear a wearable device on their wrist or for the infants that will be a wearable device on their ankles. And those devices are supposed to record the per participants' uh, activities throughout the day. And as indicated by the graph on the right-hand side, when there are high activities, then we can have an estimate that the, or we can infer that the participant is awake. But when there are low activities, um, and during the 24-hour period, then we can make inferences that participants are perhaps asleep. But we can see that during those sleep periods, there are still wake moments with pretty high activity levels. So how the manufacturer algorithm works? Usually uh, with, with those devices, uh, you can obtain sleep estimates like duration of night sleep, uh, how many wake ups you have during the night from the manufacturer algorithm. But how well does it work? The uh, basic logic of the manufacturer algorithm is that they use uh, information from neighboring epochs. And in the case of ActiveWatch, they use five consecutive epochs, which is um, equivalent to 2.5 minutes, uh, which is um, a relatively short period. And a weighted average of the activity counts for those five epochs were calculated. And then it would compare to a threshold and then decide whether the participant is asleep or awake. When we compare the uh, manufacturer algorithm with PSG data, as you can see from those two graphs, for a true sleep onset latency, which is how much time does it take for the participant to fall asleep? The manufacturer algorithm underestimates for a lot of those participants. So for instance, if we are looking at this blue dot, you can see that um, even though according to PSG, the participant, it took the participant over one hour to fall asleep. According to the manufacturer algorithm, the sleep onset latency was just a few minutes. And this kind of underestimation is um, really um, dangerous. Um, because um, sleep onset latency uh, is a very important indicator for sleep uh, disorders like insomnia. And also for patients with mild cognitive impairment, prolonged sleep latency was associated with decreased brain stem volume. So we really don't want, want this kind of underestimation of sleep onset latency. However, if we look at number of night awakenings, we can see that um, Manufacturer algorithm overestimate the number of uh, night awakenings and the, each of the night awake, awakening, the last duration of each night awakenings was um, shorter. This was also um, perhaps due to the fact that the uh, manufacturer algorithm only used rel relatively short windows of only five consecutive epochs or 2.5 minutes, and that make the algorithm um, more likely to have fast switch uh, between sleep and awake. And that re results in um, more counts of night awakenings, but shorter durations of each of the night awakenings, which is um, less 
likely to happen during real life in real life. So uh, some of the previous efforts in improving the algorithm by developing a machine learning algorithm um, were published in 2019 using uh, data from four different studies. Uh, namely an acoustic study where healthy adults uh, who sleep was disturbed by noise, a TI study where older adults were taking some medication, sleep restriction study where healthy adults in controlled, uh, are, were in controlled standardized conditions, and a night workers study where um, we uh, monitor daytime sleep in night workers. So these four studies um, cover a pretty wide range of uh, age of adults and different conditions, different study conditions. The inclusion criteria were uh, each of the participants need to provide at least three sleeping periods. And for uh, each sleeping period, we obtain uh, roughly a thousand epochs of data. And for each epoch, uh, we have uh, activity counts for 30 seconds. A table one uh, shows the number of participants and the number of available sleeping period for um, those participants. So um, we uh, only included participants with more equals or more than three uh, sleeping period. So, and the maximum number of sleeping period participants provided were 11 sleeping periods. And that gives, up, uh, gives us a sample of uh, 58 participants in total. Uh, in that um, project, uh, two procedures uh, were compared in terms of uh, deciding the machine learning um, training data set and test data set. So uh, as illustrated in this graph, uh, for all participants included in the study, we separate one sleeping period as a test data and the remaining data set are included in the training data. For the first approach, which we call generalized approach, all training data from the participants were contaminated, and then a generalized machine learning model were developed based on the contaminated data. Then after that, the generalized uh, machine learning model were fit to each of the test data from each of the participants, and then the uh, results were compared with the PSG data to assess the accuracy or the performance of the algorithm. With the personalized approach, uh, different models, different machine learning models were developed based on the training data set of each of the participant. So as illustrated in this, um, in this graph, um, for all 54 participants, uh, we developed 54 different um, algorithms to estimate sleep versus wake. And those uh, models were applied to the test data set of each of the participant accordingly. Uh, in that paper, uh, only summary statistics, statistics were used in the, um, as the features in the machine learning model um, with a window size of 21. So instead of using window size of only five epochs, uh, a, a window size of 21 epochs was used to calculate mean percentile sum of value, standard deviation, so on and so forth to, um, as the features entered into the machine learning model. And um, we also uh, included 21 normalized actigraphy measures within the window, which were the lagged variables. Uh, that paper also compared five different machine learning algorithms, which were naive based, regularized logistic regression, random forest, ADA boost, and extreme gradient boosting using the exact same uh, features. Uh, the general conclusion uh, from that paper was that comparing the five different models, XGBoost produced in general the best performance over the other um, machine learning algorithms. In a lot of uh, machine learning applications, people find extreme gradient boosting um, is uh, outperforming other methods um, because uh, this uh, method has a lot of strengths in terms of um, uh, working with imbalanced data um, and avoiding overfitting and also uh, working with data with collinearity and interactions. And it is also thought to be less time consuming and more efficient way. 
And extreme gradient boosting is also a tree-based model. And uh, it implements decision trees with boosted gradient. And the basic idea is that in each iteration, the algorithm will learn from the errors from previous iteration. And um, at, at last, um, it will create an ensemble classifier, <clears throat> which um, is uh, sought to improve the sought to have the enhanced performance and also on faster speed. However, uh, we were also note we also noticed that with the previous method, the sensitivity and um, meaning the how sensitive the model is in detecting weak epochs um, during sleep time is still pretty low, even if we use extreme gradient boosting. Therefore, we are thinking, um, we are trying to explore more and try thinking of ways to optimize the machine learning algorithm so that we can have better performance with those uh, with personalized approach and, uh, or, and generalized approach. So there are several things that we considered uh, in our effort to optimize the algorithm. So first of all, we uh, were aware that the previous machine learning algorithm only includes features of uh, summary features for each of the uh, windows. And we were wondering if we um, include a dynamic inspired features, if the um, performance will be better. And we also considered um, two different ways to do dimension reduction, which are TCNA and um, principal component analysis. In addition, uh, we also considered adding cross-validation procedures to improve model robustness. And um, given that the um, data uh, was highly unbalanced, meaning we have uh, more um, sleep counts than weight counts, instead of using um, accuracy as the optimization metric, we use area under the curve as the optimization metric. Uh, to deal with the unbalanced data issue, we also tested different ways to choose cutoff threshold to decide um, wake versus sleep. So again, we use uh, to uh, to make the comparison fair. We use exactly the same data set that were used in the previous paper, uh, including uh, fifty four participants. And we also included the features that were used in the previous um, paper, which were the summary statist statistics uh, using a window size of 30, 21, and also the uh, lagged, uh, 21 lagged variables, which, give us, uh, gives, um, which gives us uh, 39 features in total. Um, like I mentioned before, on the Thing we first consider that might help to improve the algorithm is to include dynamic features. So uh, in our um, exploration, we included um, a couple of dynamic features, which were um, entropy, max level shift, max variance shift, um, and so on and so forth. And those um, dynamic features, VCD summarizes our uh, describers, describes how um, stable the time series are within that window, and how um, and also as well as how predictable uh, the time series was uh, within a specific window size. Um, in addition to looking at window size of twenty one, we also included longer we uh, are like um longer windows uh, or larger window sizes. So um, those window sizes were inspired by the uh, sleep wake cycle of uh, human beings. And those include uh, window sizes of 61, 121, and 181. So that those equivalent to uh, 30 minutes, an hour, and an hour and a half. Uh, we um, obtained the feature importance by uh, from the extreme gradient boosting algorithm. And our first finding is that um, the dynamic features as highlighted in yellow do show more importance than a lot of those summary, summary statistics. 
So for instance, for personalized approach, um, the um, only summary statistics uh, aside from the movement counts of the window with a uh, mean 90, 90 percentile and skewness and all the rest important features were all from the dynamic parameters. And for generalized approach, uh, we also see a number of um, dynamic parameters uh, listed as more important features than the summary statistics. And those results show um, it is helpful, it might be helpful to consider including dynamic features in addition to summary statistics, summary statistics in developing machine learning algorithms in this um, scenario and maybe for other time series data. Another observation we have is that um, including uh, window sizes of um, more minutes, in our case, um, 30 minute windows or one hour window or even an hour and a half window are helpful as many of those important features listed here are actually from longer window size. So this also um, give us um, a hint that in modeling time series, it is very important to consider the nature of the processes and then uh, think, up, think about uh, what are the important uh, window sizes to consider. So in our scenario, since we are working with sleep data, therefore we think it is important to consider the uh, normal sleep wake cycles, sleep cycles of human beings, and then and derive our features based on that information. Next. Hi, uh, yes? Can I ask a question just to make sure, sure. that I understand the uh, setup? Mm -hmm. So for each participation participant, you have a sequence of like uh, from, I'm just pretending, right? So let's say from uh, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. or some uh, 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. to 10 a.m. window, you yes. have my activity data, right? Yes. And then the, is the, in the personalized approach where you're fitting a model for me using my data, mm -hmm. uh, the, we, is the each window the unit of observation? Is that correct for me to so, understand? Um, so the, the so the epochs are um, the activity counts are the raw data are for every thirty seconds. So um, and the window means how many epochs I included in deriving those um, features. Gotcha. So for instance, where we have a window size of twenty one, then the mean would be the mean average count of this 21 epochs. So in the previous slide, when you have a personalized approach mm -hmm. for the, uh, the training and the testing, you're dividing mm -hmm. the epochs, right? So for me, whatever yes. the 30 seconds. Yeah, okay. for the training and test. Um, um, yes and no, it's not dividing the epochs. It's like using the whole night um, data as a test, the test data set and the rest of sleeping period as training data set. So for the same sleeping period, it won't be uh, divided into like to uh, into training or the test data set. Does that make sense? So we divide the training and the um, test data set based on sleeping periods, not based on the epochs. I see. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, okay. because for each participant, it has multiple sleeping periods. Okay, so for yeah. someone who has three sleeping periods, which is mm -hmm. the minimum number of sleeping periods that you yeah. should have to be included in the yeah. study, yes, you're going to use two of them as the training data and yes. one of them as the test data. Gotcha. All right. Correct. Thank you. Sorry and, about that. Yeah, and no problem. And if, if the participants has an um, eight sleeping periods, then uh -huh. seven will be used as training data set, and one night will be used as the test data set. I got it. So the difference mm -hmm. between the XGBoost models between two participants is basically the number of the tuning parameters are different for each of them, right? Yes, the tuning parameters. And also the model would be different for each um, participant. For instance, uh, the number of embeddings or the helpful uh, lag variables to include it for each participant would also be different. But th that would be a tuning parameter that you have, that's something that you have to tune though, right? Yes. Okay, got it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the question. 
So um, let's uh, continue talking about the two dimension deduction procedures that we um, tested out in the study. So the first uh, is perhaps something uh, that we are more familiar with, which is called principal component ana analysis. So uh, basically the idea is that uh, for each principal component, we want to maximize the variation that the component explains, but also uh, minimize the error of the values along the line, which are um, the red lines uh, in the, uh, in, as illustrating this graph. Another method um, that we tested out is called uh, TCNA. Uh, it is also an unsupervised on dimension reduction approach, but uh, the difference is that it is a nonlinear and then a dimension reduction approach. And the idea is that uh, it reduces um, observations from a high dimensional approach and then tries to map, map it on a, a lower dimension approach. For instance, in this graph, it is trying to uh, map those uh, three groups of dots from the two dimensional and um, area to, uh, like a, to a single line and still retain the uh, group um, membership from this dimension reduction. And the hope is that even though we have this um, lower dimensional representation, we can still recover um, the similarities of the dots or the group membership of those dots. And this approach cannot preserve, um, preserve the variance but um, it focuses more on preserve the distance using hyperparameters or uh, preserve the local structure or the neighborhood or the clusters of those observations. Another thing we included um, in our um, application is that we use threefold cross-validation for this um, time series data when we are um, developing our um, algorithm. So uh, we talked about uh, setting one night as a test data set, and the rest data set will be our training data set. Then in developing our um, model or our um, estimation algorithm, where we use threefold cross validation, for instance, for this participant, we use uh, 16, uh, even though the participant have um, a very long time series, we start with using only 16 hours as training data set and then validate the model using 16, hours of data as the validation procedure. And then we, um, the second iter in the second iteration, we use 32 hours as training and then validate again using 16 hours of data. And then in the last iteration, we use 48 hours as training and then uh, the rest 16 hours as validation. Uh, we included, um, the performance measures that are usually uh, found to be helpful in machine learning, um, um, in machine learning work. So um, first, um, our positive case or sleep case, because uh, it is sleep research and um, by convention, um, it, uh, for sleep researchers, they are more used to use sleep as the positive case. And uh, the negative case would be wake incidences. So uh, in this case, our sensitivity measure means how many sleep epochs are correctly identified as sleep. And the specificity, specificity measure um, answers how many weak epochs are correctly identified as awake. And uh, as in our, uh, as the purpose for this classification algorithm, as you can imagine, specificity is more important than sensitivity because we are only looking at the sleep period, and if we are more concerned with um, uh, disordered sleep or sleep problems like night awakenings or um, problems in falling asleep, then it is more important for us to uh, find those weak epochs than find the sleep epochs. We also have a um, positive um, predictive value, which are which represents upon all those um, positive cases or those sleep cases, how many of them are truly sleep and a negative predict predictive value, which represent among all those awake epochs, how many of them are actually awake. In addition, we also look at some uh, more um, summar summarized measures like um, ba balanced accuracy and area under the curve and also F1 statistic. 
So um, we used balanced accuracy instead of accuracy because of imbalanced data. So we know that uh, for we are only looking at sleeping period. So we have more, much way more sleep epochs than wake epochs. So if we only focus on uh, sensitivity, then um, the our then we will uh, probably get very high sensitivity even if we really classify all epochs as sleep, which is what we don't want. So we use balanced accuracy instead. So uh, let's um, take a look at some of our um, findings from this study. Um, so uh, in this table, we can see that the first row uh, shows the manufacturer results from the where we use manufacturer classification. And uh, from the um, measurement uh, from the statistics uh, from the um, uh, statistics we calculate for those uh, measurement criteria, we can see that uh, we have really um, pretty low uh, specificity, which are uh, the which and also pre uh, pretty low uh, negative um, specificity, which indicates our ability in ident identifying weak epochs during the sleep period. And of course, the sensitivity is really high because uh, the manufacturer algorithm is more likely to classify the um, sleep period, the epochs as sleep versus awake. Uh, when we compare our results using uh, just summary statistics and uh, the case where we use both summary statistics and dynamic features, we can see improvement uh, in those uh, criteria, in most of the criteria, including area under the curve, and also on um, the, for instance, negative predictive value, and also F1 statistics. So this shows the, um, it is helpful to include dynamic features, and it helps um, the classification algorithm in general. And we can also see that after adding the cross-validation procedure, and the measurement uh, criteria shows that the algorithm, the performance of the algorithm is even better. For instance, for specificity, it rises, uh, increases from 0.55 to 0.65. Uh, when comparing the two uh, dimension in depth uh, and dimension reduction procedures, uh, what we find in our application is that PCA performed better than TCNA embedding procedures uh, for most of the um, criteria. And uh, with T PCA, uh, we were able to reduce the number of features from over 100 features to roughly around 30 features. And um, those results are all from the personalized approach where we develop a machine learning algorithm just using one person's data and then apply this algorithm to the test data set, which is one sleeping period of data. What we also observe, uh, what we also observe is that um, we were able to in, um, improve the and algorithms ability to identify wake periods during the sleep period. So with the manufacturer algorithm or the um, original published paper algorithm, the specificity was around 0.4, but when we include dynamic features, cross-validation procedures, and, and also principal component uh, analysis as dimension reduction, the specificity was um, increased to um, 0.68. When we look at the generalized approach, we are, um, again, we contaminated all participants' data, develop a general um, algorithm to estimate sleep versus week, and then apply this algorithm to each of the participants' testing data set. What we found is, again, it is helpful to include um, dynamic features. However, due to we have a much larger data set, the improvement is less obvious. And uh, is um, as uh, in this highlighted line, and it's also helpful to increase cross validation. And uh, when we use um, when we pick a threshold that's consider that takes into consider the imbalanced data, and then the estimation results uh, isn't it can be um, 
could be even better with better negative predictive value. So um, let's um, check the parameter estimates that uh, sleep researchers usually care about. So in, at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about how uh, sleep onset latency or the number of minutes it took for participants to fall asleep could be underestimated by the manufacturer algorithm as indicated by the red crosses in this graph. You may still remember this uh, data point where um, the participant uh, spent over an hour to fall asleep, but according to the manufacturer algorithm, the um, sleep onset latency was only a few minutes. We can see that using the machine learning algorithm, especially with the generalized approach, the estimation for sleep onset latency is much better, much improved from the manufacturer algorithm. And all those blue dots are much closer to the diagonal line, which would uh, indicate a perfect um, prediction based on the PSG data. When we look at night, uh, number of night awakenings, um, we talked about how manufacturer algorithm might overestimate the number of night awakenings as indicated by those red crosses. We can see that using machine learning algorithm, the dots, um, either the blue dots indicating the generalized approach, or the green dots indicating the personalized approach, stays much closer to the diagonal line. So um, currently we are working on, on exploring deep learning algorithms to even uh, make this uh, estimation more accurate. And uh, instead of just using steep um, period data, we are also looking at other data sets which collected 24 hours of activity data and see how the algorithm can work to um, find uh, um, um, out of those 24 hours activity data, which are the sleeping period, uh, which are perhaps the nap period during the daytime. And uh, we don't want to stop at just doing sleep weight classification. We are also interested in looking at how the algorithm or which algorithm would work better in terms of classifying different states, sleep stages. And uh, there are also, of course, other applications of this um, algorithm. And uh, so uh, we what we were what we just covered are okay, um, sleep versus uh, wake classification during the night period. And for sleep stage classification, we want to um, incorporate other information to find uh, which uh, sleep stage the participant is uh, likely to stay in for the whole sleep um, period, which are on the rapid eye movement stage, stage one through stage four. So the other information we are planning to incorporate are the data streams from electrodermal activities, for instance, and also blood volume uh, information and heart rate information, and of course, accelerometer data, accelerometer data. And in terms of other applications, uh, we talked about um, if uh, we would be able to identify a sleeping period uh, using 24-hour sleep data and identify the nap period during the daytime. And uh, we are also interested in uh, looking at off-risk um, ways to identify off-risk period during the 24-hour data collection period. So um, usually we would assume that with wearable device, uh, there would be less issue with um, participants' compliance or um, issues with reporting, but uh, in real life, uh, we found that it is um, very likely for us to have, um, it is not uncommon for us to observe weird um, activity counts in our um, activities, even though it is not, uh, it, even though it is not um, missing data in normal sense, sometimes we may observe uh, extremely high um, activity counts and those might be uh, moments where, uh, for instance, the participants put their hand on a mixer or put their um, watch on a car while they're driving. So we are trying to, using different um, patterns of um, movements to identify periods which are unlikely to be uh, human activities using a deep learning approach. And after we were able to identify those um, 
missing locations. We are also trying to, uh, we are also planning to look more into missing data handling approach using machine learning algorithms, applications of missing data handling approach in machine learning algorithms to better um, maybe impute those missing locations or uh, maybe handle uh, 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 or maybe uh, back, um, improve our uh, sleep-wake estimates, even though we have those missing locations in our data set. Uh, so this is an overview of the works that we are currently working on. And um, I would like to thank my collaborators in the Modeling Environmental Systems Lab, and also Sleep Health Society Laboratory, and also the Laboratory for Intelligent Systems and Analytics. analytics. Uh, we would also like to thank our funding agencies, which make all those work possible, and also um, participants who contributed um, all the data, and of course, recruiters, interviewers, and coders who spend a lot of time in cleaning up the data and putting the data together. Um, here I also have my email address. If you have any um, comments, suggestions, or questions regarding our work, uh, feel free to um, ask me or email me. And uh, I'm also happy to take questions. Well, thank you very much, Ling Ying. Uh, are there any questions for Ling Ying? I mean, I can ask millions, but <laughs> let's give other people the chance. Mm -hmm. If you have questions, you can simply unmute yourself and ask. I think it's the easiest way. Okay, while uh, maybe others are getting ready, I, I'll have a few, uh, like two questions I just mainly wanted to ask. One was the t the dimension reduction using T-Sneak, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it's a nonlinear dimension reduction and yep. you have, uh, hyperparameters that you have to tune there as yes. well, right? Yeah. So when you're using personalized approach, are you tuning hyperparameters for T-SNIC as well as XGBoost for each individual? Yes, we do and, We do individual tuning. Okay, and uh, so uh, like when it comes to T-Snake, I think visually is where, I mean, at least this is how I know. So I might not know all the details about, for example, tuning perplexity. It's mm -hmm. easy if you visualize the data to figure out which one yeah. is better, yeah. right? So how do you do that within the algorithm? Of course, you can't visualize things within an algorithm. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that may uh, that might be one reason why t in our case did not work as better as okay. PCA because um, the, if I my understanding is correct, is uh, cares more about uh, getting the clusters correct. But in our case, it is more important to preserve the variance structure. Or uh, like okay. uh, with PCA, it is more concerned more about like which uh, group or which combination of the features may explain the most variance of the um, of the data set that we that we obtain. So um, and it is uh, in that case uh, in that sense easier to. Um, uh, um, evolved less tuning than uh, TCNA. So um, I, my, our guess is that that's um, the main reason why we obtain better results using principal component analysis. Did you ever try like using generalized approach, like generalized data and tuning the perplexity and uh, using that whatever, like tuning parameters on individual models? Uh, so you mean the contaminated data and then tuning the so what I mean is, at least in my head, the generalized approach means that you are, con yeah, concatenating yeah, all the patients, data, yeah. right, all the individuals, and mm -hmm. tune the uh, T snake yeah. on all, like you yes. select the hyperparameters in all, and then basically use the XG boost on yes. every. Have you tried that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. For the generalized model, we also tried that using T C N A, and the performance was uh, still worse than the okay. gotcha. analysis. Yeah. All right. Um, my second question was the interesting uh, cross-validation approach, right? So when you're mm -hmm. doing the time series cross-validation, so you have the first uh, 16 hours, I think, yes. and then your validation 16 hours, yes, and then 32, 16, uh, mm -hmm. which I totally get. But yeah. my curiosity is why not 16 and then the rest of the stuff and then 32 rest of the stuff? Is that Was there a reason why you wanted to keep 
not using the uh, far right corner, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So uh, in term series analysis, so first of all, in cross validation, we cannot randomly pick a section of the data and then develop model because we want yeah. to retain the time order structure. And the second thing, which is very important for time series analysis is that we don't want data leak. So when we develop the model or test the model, we don't want um, like um, data, uh, we want to preserve certain parts of the data that we don't use for testing instead of like um, utilizing those um, future information in developing our model. That's why we always um, keep um, like uh, keep a section of the data that uh, like untouched when we're um, developing model in each iteration. I. I see. Okay. So, uh, hmm. so maybe it's easier for me to show the graph. So uh, you were talking about uh, yeah. train the model using the first 16 hours. We may validate the model using the rest of the data, right? Yeah. So in that case, the rest rest of the data will already be, already be used. So in like uh, evaluating the performance of the algorithm. So that would be considered as um, data leakage or like using future information that we are not supposed to use uh, in the first iteration. Uh, so we always want to uh, keep some data that are that are untouched uh, in, valid in validation so that uh, we have this three-fold cross-validation. So each in, in each fold, like it has its um, own purpose. I see, I see. I, I, okay, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I get it. Uh, uh -huh. All right. Yeah, I, I'm sure there are better ways to explain that, but yeah. No, no, I, I think I understand because in my head, I mean, it's very obvious that the training and validation should be done as the way that you're doing because it's yeah. time series. The part mm -hmm. that I uh, wasn't clear to me is that why the white box, right? Because if you yeah. train with the blue box, and then you are predicting the future, uh, in and the test set you're like keeping it separate. Some of the data will be used like three times, right? For the last sixteen hours, for instance, it will be used in the first iteration, then again in the second iteration, and then again in the third iteration. I think I see your point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I have another question <laughs> about the, oh, Siming has a question, yeah. so I'll let her ask the question. Thank you, Parbani. And thank you, Linying. I really like the plots that you created to show the performance of the machine learning approaches compared to the factory uh, algorithm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask a more general question, right? So I think, you know, the issue of deciding between a personalized versus a generalized approach, right? To doing either classification, right? Model inference and so forth. It's something that, you know, people have to make a decision on, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, and there are, you know, something somewhere in between, right? That people mm -hmm. in you know, statistics, you know, statistical areas are used to sort of mix effects type approach, yeah. right? Which may be very counterintuitive, right? Or unfamiliar to maybe colleagues, you know, from mm -hmm. engineering, for example. Yeah. Who are yeah. used to this sort of individualized right mm -hmm. approach of single unit. So, in your opinion, then you know how do we sort of gain in in uh you know how how can we best integrate information from both both approaches in empirical scenarios? Like mm -hmm. Why do we switch from generalized to personalized, mm -hmm. and whether mm -hmm. there are things that we can see from our data mm -hmm. that will take making that kind of decisions? Yeah, I think from the study, the good news is that even we use one person's data and only three nights of data, our algorithm still produce um, pretty good results uh, with the personalized approach, and that is with limited number of data sets, uh, data points in our uh, in our analysis. But of course, we are using sleep data, so even if it's only like three nights of data for each night, we have uh, around a thousand epochs, so it is not like short time series. So, but the good news is even with only one person's data, with the personalized approach, and our algorithm was able to produce some pretty good results. Mm -hmm. And another thing we learned from that is it's of course um, 
more uh, optimal to have a larger data set. So in general, the, with the generalized approach, uh, it is less important if we uh, use uh, uh, how well we uh, we work, uh, how hard we work on in terms of feature and um, feature engineering. So, for instance, uh, with a generalized approach, even even if we only use summary statistics, statistics, uh, the results we obtained are very um very close. Or uh, um, the difference between using just summary statistics and use summary st statistics plus dynamic features and the principal uh, component analysis are less significant or less um, um, just to be different than the personalized approach. So when you have large enough data set, even if your feature engineering is not ideal, you may still get pretty good estimation results. And we can see that um, in our scenario, where we use generalized approach by um, developing model based on the contaminated data, our um, estimation results or the algorithm performance is slightly better than the personalized approach. And um, of course, uh, we are in the process of developing methods to integrate some of the uh, mixed uh, method uh, ideas, uh, which we are more used to in uh, statistics into the machine learning algorithms. But uh, those methods are still under development. And one approach that we are considering is um, uh, in addition to estimating, uh, like when we are using the generalized approach where we contaminate everyone's data, in addition to estimating the steep weight classification results, we may also uh, estimate the um, IDs of the participants. So in that way, and uh, we tell the algorithm that uh, those data are not from one single person. And we trying to make the algorithm aware of the different uh, membership of those data points. So we are hoping that this could be one way to integrate some of the um, uh, uh, multi-level ideas uh, so, um, so called to the machine learning approach. And um, uh, if you have read about other ideas in carbon or and solving this multi-level issue, um, it will be, of course, really great and appreciated if you can let me know other models or algorithms available. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So in practice, what is the, just to get an idea, right? So you have this mm -hmm. huge machine that you first yeah. at the beginning showed that uh, the clinically they use, and yeah. now you have a machine learning approach. Let's say that you take my activity data and you categorize whether I'm sleeping at a mm -hmm. given window and awake at a given window. And likewise, what, what's the usage in practice on doing that? So like, is that uh, detecting sleep apnea and things like that? Mm -hmm. So um, PSG, which is more accurate or considered as the um, gold standard uh, in measuring sleep versus wake is used, as you said, used in clinical settings. So if you need a sleep diagnosis, then it's very likely that you will be brought into a sleep lab and then be wired up and then do gotcha. the spray imaging stuff. But uh, in sleep research, sometimes you want to observe uh, participants in real life Sleeping in a lab is, of course, different from sleeping at home with uh, different home environments. And also, uh, we have uh, different, um, we, we may have a day to day frustrations, for instance, uh, if we are in everyday life. So, the active watch or uh, wearable device is more applicable if you want to uh, follow or observe a participant for a longer period of time in real life settings. And this will give you inferences. Um, maybe less accurate, but uh, for a longer period of time of activities. And also that another benefit is that it is real life uh, observations instead of uh, lab conditioned uh, observations. Got it, all right, sounds good. Any other questions? So did you look at reliability um, compared to visually corrected? Um, actigraphy or or rather than just the manufacturer's algorithm algorithm uh yeah that's a really good question so um if i understand correctly you are asking about a uh, manufacturer um visually corrected uh, manufacturer algorithm which is like supposed to improve the original classification from the manufacturer correct yes yeah actually in our uh in the the so-called manufacturer algorithm I used is already visually corrected by the uh, research assistant in the lab. So uh, basically what the research assistant did is 
uh, they uh, look at the activity counts and the manufacturer classification uh, throughout uh, the measuring period, which uh, could be three days or uh, over a week or even longer. And uh, when they observe uh, clearly and wrongly classified uh, APOCs, they will manually fix those. And uh, those uh, manual fixes were performed by two uh, research assistants simultaneously, and their results will be compared and discussed when there were discrepancies. Thank you. Thank you. But you can imagine those would uh, evolve a lot of manual work, and uh, it took a really long time for um, the um, research assistants to go through all the sleep, uh, sleep period files. And uh, we are processing like a lot of uh, data from different studies. So it is uh, even more crucial for us to have like a better machine learning algorithm to automate some of those processes. <coughs> All right, we are almost at five uh, Ling in. So thank you very much. It was a great talk. Uh, it was good to uh, see you again as well. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, hopefully we'll see you in a uh, couple of weeks. Thank you for thank you. coming to my presentation.